In this section, we'll look at the sense of sight and factors that affect visibility. Visual stimuli are perceived as light entering the eyeballs. In the front of the eye is a hole, the pupil, that expands and contracts to let light in. Incoming light is focused by the lens so that it falls on the back of the eye, which is the retina. The retina is covered with receptors that convert different wavelengths of light into nerve signals that are passed to the brain. We have two types of receptors, rods that only sense in black and white, and cones that sense in color. The very middle of the retina is called the fovea, and it contains mostly rods. In bright light, the pupil is small, so all of that light comes in and is focused right on the fovea, so we see in full color. In dim light, the pupil expands to let in as much light as possible, and most of the light hits the sides of the retina, where we only have rods. So in dim light, our vision is mostly in black and white. Our peripheral vision is also in black and white because light coming into our eyes from off to the side hits at such an angle that it passes through to the sides of the retina. Rods are much more sensitive than cones and can detect really small amounts of, of light. They're also really sensitive to movement, which is why movement in our peripheral vision is a good attention getter. Most people have three types of cones, so they're called trichromats. People with red-green color blindness are missing one type, so they're called dichromats, which is much more common in men. However, mothers and daughters of dichromats are often tetrachromats. They have an extra type of cone and they can see a wider range of colors. The stimulus that gets to the eye is affected by everything that happens up to that point. First of all, the brightness of the light that's hitting the thing that you're looking at changes how bright or clear it is. That original light source we call luminous flux. The farther from that light source the object is, the less light gets to it. The amount of light that gets there is called illuminance. Then, the properties of the object itself affect how much of that light gets reflected off and how much gets absorbed. This is called the reflectance of the object. Some wa wavelengths are absorbed and some are reflected. The color that you perceive is the reflected wavelengths all mixed together. The amount of light that gets to you is called the, the luminance and that's the image that your brain perceives. The way that light bounces off an object has a big effect on what you see. There are three types of reflection that we'll talk about. The first is the most common, diffuse reflection. This is when light is scattered off in many different directions, and that's how light bounces off most objects that you look at. The second is mirror reflection, which is just what it sounds like, the way light bounces off a mirror or a reflective surface. It bounces off at the same angle that it came in at, which is why the picture is preserved, why you can see objects in a mirror reflection, and you can't see anything really coherent in a diffuse reflection. Finally, retro reflection keeps light even more tightly focused than mirror reflection. All light that hits a retroreflective surface is returned back exactly where it came from. This means that the amount of illuminance is very close to the amount of luminance. All of the light that came in gets back to the viewer. For that reason, retroreflection is often used in high visibility clothing. Because retroreflective surfaces send all of the light back to the light source, for them to work at making a person more visible, the viewer needs to be directly in line with the light source. You can try this with any garment that has reflective trim, like running shoes or backpacks, and a flashlight. If you hold the flashlight right next to your eye and shine the light on the reflective material, it'll light up with a very bright reflected light. But if you move that flashlight away from your eye, with it still shining on the material, suddenly that material looks really dull again. That's because the light is now coming back to your hand, and that hand is not near your eye. Retroreflective materials are used for visibility because in a lot of situations that require visibility, the viewer is in a car. Cars have headlights that are in line with the driver's eyes, so the light of the headlights will be returned to, to the car and the viewer will see it. However, if a runner is not directly in line with the headlights, for example, like if the driver's making a turn, the retroreflective material won't work. This is true for light-up visual signals too, like alert lights. If the light is out of the viewer's field of view, it's not likely to capture attention. For this reason, on-body visual displays are effective in only a few body areas, the ones that are likely to enter the field of view, like the wrists. However, some on-body displays are not meant for the wearer. They're meant to communicate something to a viewer. Retroreflection usually tries to make objects visible by making them as bright as possible. But there are other variables that influence how visible something is. For example, the eye is differently sensitive to different colors. 
we're most sensitive to yellow and yellow-green and least sensitive to red. But we're also fundamentally sensitive to contrast. So a yellow-green object against a spring lawn would be much less visible than a red object against the same background. The highest contrast is between black and white. We use cycles of black and white to define the resolution of things like text. The rule of thumb is that text should be no more than three cycles per degree of visual angle. So that means three black stripes and three white stripes in each angle of the area that you can see. Because it's an angle, the same page of text would have fewer cycles per, de per degree when it's close to your face than when it's far away. We're also sensitive to human-like shapes. So if your reflective material or visibility technique highlights the shape of the body or shows human-like movement, viewers will be more sensitive to it. For example, retroreflective material on the back of a cyclist's torso will be much less likely to capture a viewer's attention than reflective material that highlights the leg movements and shapes. Visibility materials can also be used to define orientation. This design for a firefighter suit helps rescuers figure out what orientation the firefighter is in based on the markings that are visible. They can tell if they're looking at the back, the side, or the front of the gear, even if most of the body is buried. Camouflaging techniques do just the opposite of visibility techniques. They try to help an object or person blend into the environment. Many of the principles we just discussed can be reversed. For example, camouflage tries to blend into its environment by matching colors and patterns. If the contrast between the camouflage pattern and the environment is low, the viewer's brain will help blend the image. Even blocky camouflage pa patterns are not very visible if the colors are well matched. However, camouflage relies on movement as well as contrast. In a natural environment where leaves and grasses are moving, a stationary camouflaged object may be conspicuous. Covers like this ghillie suit try to mimic textures and movements as well as colors.